Hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel at Harassus Global 2020 Global Visions Conference. My name is Isabel Maxwell, and it's my honor and pleasure to moderate this panel, Advancing the Fifth Industrial Revolution. There's a lot to talk about in 45 minutes, allowing for introductions and hopefully some questions at the end. So let's get stuck right in. I do actually want to thank Frank Richter for his own recent thought piece on the Fifth Industrial Revolution, in which he showed his strong and aspirational hopes for putting humanity back into tech, as it were. But let me introduce our excellent and eclectic panel. Um, first, we have Yali Sar. Please raise your hand quickly so we can see. Thank you. He's the CEO and co-founder of Taylor Brands, which is an AI-driven platform that designs, writes copy, and devises creative strategy without human intervention. His company provides branding to over 18 million businesses worldwide, and their research focuses on how creativity can be patterned and automated. And he's also fascinating to talk to about the subject of how empathy can be patterned and automated. Mikkel Mosker, D. Phil Oxford, is the co-founder and CEO of Evolution Q, a quantum safe cybersecurity company. He co-founded Software QC Inc. and the non-for-profit Quantum Safe Canada. He's on the board of Quantum Industry Canada, and he's the co-founder and professor of the Institute for Quantum Computing at Waterloo. He's globally recognized for his drive to help academia and industry and government prepare our cyber systems to be safe in an era with quantum computers. And just this very morning in an earlier panel at Harassis, I listened to the president of Armenia state that he thought that cybersecurity was more important than energy. So Mikhail's expertise is going to be ever more valuable and necessary. Sam Glassenberg has spent his career leading teams and companies at the cutting edge of the video game industry at companies like Lucasfilm and Microsoft. He's the CEO of Level X, which is a medical video game company that harnesses game technology and cognitive neuroscience to engage and train over 700,000 medical professionals here on Earth and prepare astronauts for health emergencies in space. COVID alone has shown us that disasters can become exponential due to lack of preparedness. So I'm very much looking forward to Sam's comments here today too. Emidio do Sacramento is a futurist and founder and CEO of Zebia Metrics in Switzerland, which is the Airbnb of mobile sharing. No matter your brand vendor or operating system, he says, you will be able to access all of your virtual world in less than 10 seconds. You can borrow or rent any device, log in, and you'll be up and running with all your virtual worlds, professional and private, bundled as one. And he can already see magic in COVID-19, and I certainly want to hear more about that today. And our fifth panelist is Marek Mozeluski. Marek has an excellent career at the junction, eclectic career, at the junction of technology, policy, and entrepreneurship. He currently advises ENSO, which is formerly Luna, which is a data science platform that was selected by NASA as one of the top 20 most breakthrough technologies in the world. He also founded six venture-backed startups with four successful exits. He's advised Apple and Pixar, Daimler, Super Surge, Sumisoto, and GE, three U.S. presidents, and he's taught entrepreneurship at RPI and Tufts University. So our actual panel topic is that the earlier industrial revolutions broke existing boundaries with creative disruption. The fifth industrial, age, uh, industrial revolution will disrupt as well by means of heightened digitization, but with humanity and humility as it shall make the world a better rather than a just more efficient place. How can the fifth industrial revolution help us beat COVID-19? Well, I'm going to quickly define for the audience here what is meant by the fifth industrial revolution. Because if you look back at its history around the 1780s, we had mechanization, which was industrial production based on machines that were powered by water and steam. And 100 years later, by the 1870s, we had electrification, which was mass production using assembly lines. And then by the 1970s, we had the third industrial wave with automation using electronics and computers. And today we have digitization, the introduction of IoT, data analytics, and artificial intelligence and technologies that have created exponential automation and whole new industries. But the growing realization that technology alone cannot answer all the world's woes is leading us to the fifth industrial revolution where humans 
are again central, but they're focusing on deep and imaginative cooperation between man and machine. As a tech pioneer myself in the Internet 1.0 days with my early search engine Magellan, I can attest to that adage that applies as much to AI and machine learning as it ever did and does to search. Garbage in equals garbage out. So anyone who works with AI knows that the quality of the data goes a long way towards determining the quality of the result. And I also want to add a concern that I have, which is bias in equals bias out. And I'd like the panel to also consider that too in their discussion today. So my starting question to all of you regarding the revolution we are living through, in what ways are you optimistic about what is, lies ahead? Can you provide practical examples to our audience of how benefits will reach everybody rather than a select few? These questions of optimism and the general welfare are particularly poignant given the background of this conference and all our lives, COVID, where grief and economic crisis are profound, but they're also not evenly distributed. Yali, let's go over to you for the first two minutes and then we'll follow that up with um, the others after you. Go for it. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Um... Well, in most of the talks I give, I talk about how to automate creativity. And throughout my work, I came to the realization that if we could automate creativity, one of the most human traits Im imaginable, then that means computer will eventually be better at almost everything that we do. That also means that they could solve problems that we can't, such as how to properly distribute wealth. Well, they say there is a crisis in trust in technology because it's only used to further elevate the most fortunate. But the crisis that you're talking about is really with ourselves. We choose what problems we want to solve. It is our own inability to properly define our problems that prevents us from utilizing these amazing fifth industrial revolution tools to improve our future. All of our futures, not just some lucky few, right? So if we want to win over pandemics, we should not be preparing algorithmic projections for whether to impose quarantine on a specific country. That is like basically playing whack-a-mole. We should be asking what we can actually, you know, solve and what we want to know. How to minimize casualties internationally without causing global bankruptcy. A human mind can't really crunch enough data to answer that specific question, but that doesn't mean that the technology tools that at our disposals at the moment can't. Now, I'm very optimistic that if we left our politics and disagreements aside, we could utilize the technologies around us to give us the answers to stop disease, slow, slow down the planet's deterioration, or elevate the poor. Our most dire need at the moment as a global community is to set a global organization to agree on the problems that are there to solve. If we manage to do that, the resources and the technology that we currently have are well suited to do the rest. Great. Thank you very much. So, Marek. Sorry, Mikel, you're next. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Isabel. One uh, reason for optimism, I think, is the advent of a new generation of technologies that are harnessing the, the quantum laws of nature. So for example, quantum bits, if you take quantum bits of information, you can't extract information about them without disturbing the bits. Now this fundamentally new feature, we can leverage it to achieve a more secure quantum alternative to the current ways we do so-called secret key agreement on the internet. And we use this all the time when we protect our credit cards when doing online shopping, or nowadays as we put our health card numbers on the internet so we can check the results of our COVID-19 tests. Um, another example of, of uh, the paradigm shift is that a quantum computer can achieve a massive degree of parallelism that cannot be simulated by any classical computing paradigm, even if it's a cloud, neuromorphic, or supercomputing system that uses all the matter in the known universe. So researchers and now companies, including one of my other companies, SoftwareQ, we're working to find positive applications of this very special kind of parallelism, <clears throat> maybe to help find a cure to the next you know, killer pathogen uh, and many other possible uh, positive applications. One negative application, however, is that we know that this 
quantum, one thing we know this quantum parallelism can do is break the mathematical codes or many of the important mathematical codes that currently protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of essentially all of our digital infrastructures. So I guess that doesn't sound so optimistic, right? But I think this quantum threat can be a blessing in disguise because the very complicated revamping of the foundations of cybersecurity that, that the quantum threat, as I call it, forces us to do can actually lead to a foundation for our, our digital systems that is more resilient than it currently is and otherwise would be. Right? It can trigger us to build a stronger cyber immune system. <clears throat> of course, as a society, we have to choose to be proactive and build this stronger foundation versus being reactive and create a weaker foundation. And it's been a mission for many of us, and there's been many positive steps toward this proactive approach. And COVID-19, what it's done is it's created a visceral awareness of the importance of readiness and planning. So it's become a little bit easier to get people to internalize the value of quantum readiness. So I'm cautiously optimistic about creating about two things, about creating a more robust and resilient foundation for our digital infrastructures, and about creating value for humanity through these new quantum technologies. Great, terrific, thank you. Over to you, Sam. Sure thing. Um, so if COVID has shown us anything, it's demonstrated some systemic gaps and problems in our healthcare system. Some of them are the obvious ones, like the PPE, I mean, at least in the United States, the PPE problem. I mean, back in March, I was up till three o'clock in the morning one night, crafting custom PPE out of a snorkel mask and some CPAP filters because my wife works in a healthcare clinic that ran out of PPE early on in the pandemic. So across the board, we're seeing, we're seeing this. And I think one of the biggest areas that we're seeing um, a problem that was been illuminated or revealed by COVID is the challenge of disseminating medical best practices rapidly. So as COVID has you know, spread across the world, guidelines have evolved. How do you manage an air, how do you diagnose COVID? How do you treat a patient with COVID? How do you manage their airway? How do you configure the ventilator, which you need to configure very specifically for patients with COVID because their lungs behave differently, right? How do you secure their airway to intubate them uh, before you put them on the, on the ventilator, because if you follow the standard guidelines that the American Society of Anesthesiologists issues in general, those guidelines, those rules would actually, if you follow them on a COVID patient, will aerosolize the virus and put everybody in the room at risk. So how do we quickly identify best practices and then disseminate them worldwide? Um, this is something historically we're actually very bad at. It can take years or decades to disseminate new new best practices across the field of medicine. Now, right now, what we're able to do, so I, you know, my company does games for doctors. So we're able to use mobile game technology, right, to grab the you know, new COVID airway guidelines that come out of Italy, because the Italian medical societies were the first ones to hit this, translate them out of Italian and turn them into a video game so doctors worldwide can go play through all the different possibilities and play through dozens of patients and learn intuitively right, how to manage these patients and how, to, um, and how to properly deal with all the different possible outcomes. That's short term. Long term, and getting to what some of the other people here are talking about, I'm very excited about the possibility of AI to do just that, right, to have access to all of the data and studies as it comes out or as it is in development and be able to use that to create custom treatment plans for every patient. And the beauty of doing this on an AI platform is it's fully democratized. You don't need to be at the best institution in the world. You can be in a rural hospital in sub-Saharan Africa, and you can get the, you know, the same quality of, of at least decision-making when it comes to your care. Great, thank you. Emilio. Uh, yes, um, magic on COVID. That seems like a weird sentence, right? Uh, my apologize if someone is listening. and it, Maybe you've lost someone you love. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, a little bit what I listen uh, from the panel. There are incredible things being done and people are putting everything in place so that this uh, pandemic can, let's say, um, change the world in a certain way. Uh, but what we are trying to do right now is really more to go to the patient side. Um, instead of going to the uh, solution about COVID, we're trying to go to the patient side. And the patient can be the person that is infected or not infected. 
And definitely this relates to, to AI and to the project we are working for since a few years ago. So we are uh, developing what we could call a clone, an AI clone of ourselves. And that clone AI would, would definitely uh, be able to learn from, oh, for, for example, from the technologies of this panel and be able to support uh, the person on, 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 on her on the journey of uh, the healthcare, uh, personal healthcare. So um, the magic is because uh, people are understanding what's more what's going on in the, in the, in the world because uh, one of the biggest problems we are facing is that we see that basically we as humans, we create small segments uh, or some belief in COVID, someone believed that it's uh, uh, something that was invented, some belief, of the, and all this creates a big confusion. But what we like about all this is that with our um, neural systems, we are analyzing how people behave and, and how people react. And this is, of course, it, it's interesting to, to see uh, how things move. And we understood that actually people react the same way since 100 years. So uh, I think that, again, making some of the panel words I think AI is going to solve this because one of the biggest issues we found on human behavior is hurt, hurting feelings. And when people has feeling hurt by their feelings, they don't act like they should. Mm -hmm. So AI, even if we can have empathy, um, I, and it's a beautiful thing to put, it's a wonderful thing to put on AI, but hurting feelings, it's something that it's, it, should be taken out of some of, of the equation. So I see magic because I, I, I truly believe that we as humans, even as faulty as we are, even if AI will do incredible better things than us, we are magnificent. And we can see that even with this fear that it involves COVID, there is a very beautiful thing coming out. And the proof is what I listened from this panel. Incredible things are being done that we know and some that we uh, still didn't discover it. Thank you so much. Well, to, we'll come back to this. Mark. Great. I'll actually pick up a little bit on that. You know, one of the things that we're certainly seeing is, is how people use information. And there is a, there is a term used, which was basically uh, by uh, Steve Bannion, which is basically flood the tunnels with shit. And the idea was that you just keep throwing enough dis disinformation down the tunnels that people will respond to it and a given number will react to it. And that's a lot that we've seen of how people handed handled COVID information to this day. But where you see a huge, huge drop off in, in, in this is frankly with young people. And, and, and we use the term digital native usually in the fact of how they utilize devices or their familiarity instantly with devices. You even see, you know, frankly, like the Israeli military, for instance, is using um, uh, new weaponry using uh, the actual same handsets that use for video games. You know, there's a sense that it's these tools that, that create it, but it's not. Um, the, the youth are more cynical about so many of the things. They, I mean, they view Facebook as basically the world's most over-engineered uh, birthday reminder system. You know, they, they're not on that platform. Whereas, are, uh, as the people who are older are are being radicalized by it into fascism, uh, the youth are able to already start screening this information out and with new tools. Uh, particularly in AI, uh, some, of the, some of the data tools. It's not, it hasn't been a lack of data that we have. It's been the ability to sort of stream it, uh, certainly create empathy and things along those lines with it. And what we really need to see now is this next step where there's more of a democratization of the data and the tools. Um, we recently had in Los Angeles, uh, a city that is very good about keeping all its data online, was really just home analysis was able to determine that cops made five more, five times more stops with people of color. You know, they were able to, st people are able to start making these determinations and starting to take the data and make uh, these kind of findings that we have long ignored and be able to bring them to the forefront using social media and being able to disperse their findings in that way. So I, I think what we're going to see now is this real change and the real hope for me is the fact that, um, young people uh, who are far more open to people of color, all genders, um, this reaching more and more nations where you're not seeing as dominant factions in technology advancement of just being the U.S., um, certain countries in the EU. Uh, Israel's a great one. Canada's, uh, Canada's a great one where they really are sort of dominating the conversation and dominating 
the tools and how they're used. And as we see that spread more and more, we'll be able to certainly see a rising of how the information is explored, used, and be able to combat misinformation and be able to steer some of the findings that we're talking about earlier here where, you know, information from one, a good hospital can go to a more rural hospital. And we'll be able to see that networking effect start to happen as people are able to pick the data apart. Yali, perhaps you'd like to take up this last two comments here because of your reach over 18 million small businesses worldwide. And I'm just wondering when we're talking about democratization, you might like to add to this discussion here. Well, you know, what I loved about uh, the last comment is the fact that we can actually use the same tools that have been used to uh, or people perceive to have been used to uh, destroy a lot of what we see today to actually fix the same problems. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, for example, I, I kept be I, I keep being asked is, OK, so we automated um, a lot of the kind of old world professions. If we're going to start automating new world professions as well, are we going to lose all of the jobs, right? Is, is you know, are we going to automate every single job on the planet? And what's going to happen next? Um, but I think we're really just, you know, at the beginning of uh, using these tools. And there is basically an overflow of data, data today. I think that we spent probably the first few years of building the building our company, uh, trying to figure out what we're doing with all of the data that we had. And we're just slowly starting to understand how we can actually help people, uh, you know, achieve better things uh, in kind of their uh, professional lives through it. So we started by automating design. And when we started uh, automating logo design, I think the first email I ever received was please die. Uh, and I got it from a very angry uh, graphic designer. Um, but, you know, today, the beautiful thing is we have 800,000 people that come to our platform every month, new 800,000 new people coming to our platform every month. And they are using the platform to start a business. They're using the same AI that uh, somebody was afraid is going to take their jobs away, right, to actually start a new business. And we're seeing a rise of more and more people actually using the platform now that COVID has hit and you have more and more people going unemployed and you have more and more people trying to figure out how they go on a new route. So I think there's beautiful things that can be done through the dem democratization of things that were once kind of held, um, you know, by a, by a select few like creativity, like, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, data analysis in, in general, um, but yeah. Terrific. Sam, you're looking pensive there. I mean, I think this is great. Um, I, I think that, you know, we're going to see a lot of these benefits from these technologies like AI and so forth. And I think in the short term, you're going to see, yeah, as we see more and more automation, it's going to create more and more opportunity. But eventually, but I, I mean, I do think that this fifth industrial revolution is going to be short and it's going to be shorter than we expect, I think very quickly we are going to get to a point where, you know, any job and all jobs can be done by AI and machine learning systems because the human brain will have no competitive advantage. And if I, and if I, I hope back to that, to that point, you know, I think then the, the question becomes to what end, right? So if we're, we're creating all of this technology in order to automate these old world professions, right? To what end? The first industrial revolution paved the way for better quality of life. Uh, the second shortened distances and made global uh, communities possible. The third liberated information. Um, and, you know, we're kind of in the, the huge leaps of advancement of the fourth. And, you know, the, the destination of every great leap isn't really set by the devices or the technologies that enabled it, but rather by the people that are sitting behind the wheel. So it's kind of up to us to decide what we're going to use it for. And the people sitting behind the wheel have created a gigantic climate crisis right now, <laughs> you know, which is, 
But it, is it is it the, but the question is is it is it the people behind the wheel or is it the most advanced intelligence in the room? Because we haven't been in the situation yet where the most advanced intelligence is in the room, or you know, are, aren't the people behind aren't the humans behind the wheel? Sure, but I think what we've also found from data, and as much as we're collecting data, we collect it in a very specific way still, and we collect it in a way that leaders from the past have looked forward to data. That's why we have like really good data on policing, but not really good data on how people are poor and why they remain it and how to uplift them. And, you know, and I think one of the things that the human mind has proven at least, and will continue to prove for at least probably a generation or two is we do better with incomplete information than does data systems. And it's sort of like, until we get up to that point where we're collecting data in a very different way that can be processed, we still sort of are augmenting more than just leadership, but augmenting how we make decisions and are utilizing them. And again, there is a horizon on that, but that horizon is probably slightly further out until we get ways of better developing how we look at data and what's it for, how to assemble it, and how to assemble it in a way that's not full of biases. Yeah, and that's the whole thing behind all that is is a matter for me of trust. You know, do people trust the people that have the data, right, Mark? Mikhail? Are you there? Yes, so <laughs> Yeah, so I mean fundamental to all this indeed as as you're you're suggesting is about is that uh, you know, we can set the rules, uh, but if, if they're not followed or they're easily hacked, <clears throat> And these are not robust or resilient systems, and we're not going to be able to achieve the objectives. Uh, and that's what I was sort of alluding to earlier. In one of the many building blocks of, of a really, we want a society in terms of what are we aiming for? I mean, less human suffering, uh, freedom, and happiness. I mean, these are the kinds of objectives I think we want for humanity. And so, one of the building blocks, of course, is uh, the ability to communicate, uh, interconnect, and, and reliably, right? Uh, Confidentiality, you know, to do it in a confidential way where we want to <clears throat> also trust the integrity. And, of course, we want these systems available. If they're not available, there'll be a lot of human suffering as well. <clears throat> and that's why, I mean, our approach and my colleagues around the world, we, we, what we want is uh, the cryptographic foundation of our, it's all of our digital systems, our digital economy, <clears throat> to be, you know, transparent, uh, simple. It, it's a common good. <clears throat> Right. And, it, you know, so let's work together to build this common good and we can then build systems and compete and so on on top of that common good. If we get ahead of ourselves and try to gain the very foundation, uh, I think we're going to it's going to it's going to lead to a vastly suboptimal uh, configuration for humanity in terms of I mean, also everything. We want wealth generation, fairness, freedom and so on. So let's have a, a common foundation for the ability just to security communicate, reliably communicate, and have the availability of these fundamental systems. Um, and, and then, yeah, so with regards to security and reliability, I was also going to add in another thing we're seeing with people are a bit worried about this quant, you know, this exponential quantum power, which is only for certain problems, but where it is uh, an advantage, it can be a tremendous game changer. So people are worried about the quantum haves and have-nots. Again, the approach that is currently being taken is – Several of the key vendors have their quantum computing capabilities on the cloud. They're available, right? So, and I think, I hope, that's the, the pattern that has continued and these platforms continue to be available at a fair market price and so on, of course, but they actually are available uh, to benefit everyone around the world. Great. Emilio. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, I just have one, actually, a question, if I may. Uh, because often I listen to comp comparing AI with the human brain. Well, it's not fair in a way that human brain, how much per percent do you, we use? Like 10, oh. 11? <laughs> <laughs> That's myth. Uh, we, yeah. we, use, oh, we use most of our brain. The 10% thing is, is a myth. Yeah, exactly. So but I, I think that... The, the thing with AI is that definitely you can make more servers, more power, more this, more that. My question is, uh, what if we digitalize each one of these brains, six here in the panel? What's going to happen when this brain of six people will going to start working? Who's going to be better? 
the AI that was created by, or this mix of six brains that became an AI. So it, it would be interesting also to, to put the human at the right place, because saying always, which is possibly true that AI will do things that humans never did, but actually is being created by humans. So it's a little bit contradictory. So of course, yes, but what if we were, would be digitalized ourselves? How great would we be? <laughs> wow. Uh, probably, I mean, we've all, have you seen the film, what's it called with um, The Matrix? Know, he plugs himself, the Matrix, thank you. I, I want to be The Matrix all day long. I don't know about you, but I want to just plug myself in and be incredibly knowledgeable within 10 seconds about whatever it is that I'm facing. And that would be absolutely fantastic. You, you, you don't have to go far. You have uh, Neuralink, which is uh, basically working on a realistic version of uh, altered carbon which is uh, basically how do we upload our own brains uh, up, up to servers. But, I, you know, you're, there is, I think there is a difference between, you know, giving ourselves more computing powers, which is uh, one thing, uh, and AI, which is another thing. Now, the issue that we're kind of a lot of times uh, disregarding today with regards to AI is that today it's really good at answering very specific questions. Um, so you need to pose a problem and get a solution. It's not yet, you know, the AI is going to think about, you know, is going to think about how it's going to, uh, um, to create world dominance. Um, and if we want to create broader and broader AI, again, we need to kind of decide what are, what is the problem that we want the AI to focus on solving? Right, so I don't think that we can kind of integrate um, five five brains and uh, and uh, just let it talk to each other uh, because it will be kind of like a it will be a means to no end. Um, but there is a question of what are we actually trying to solve, and I think that you know uh, I think Michael, uh, you know, you you mentioned before, kind of deciding on these specific things that we should be solving in the problem in, in, in the world but what can we really agree on right one of the biggest issues today in the world is that we can't agree about nothing most of us you know will agree that life is better than death health is maybe better than sickness right we want to we want to beat hunger and abundance but the five of us here are all probably joining in from countries uh, that are also sure that democracy is better than a single party system, that global war warming is more important than industrialization. That is kind of the thought in this room of us, probably. But if we want to actually harness everybody together to focus on the same problems, we need to kind of focus on the really core ones. And this is, you know, how do we provide just more health for everyone? How do we lengthen life? Yeah, security, economic, and and food security. Without those two, everybody goes bonkers. When you're in survival mode, you actually don't care about AI or II or CI. It doesn't mean anything. Could I have a drink of water that's potable? And can I eat? And can I make sure that my family doesn't get blown up when they go out the door? Those are the problems that we need to solve. And human dignity comes with it because the people that have no dignity and are humiliated every day in and day out are so easily radicalized or become fascistized or whatever you want. And we're seeing this. You don't have to go out any further than the United States of America right now to see this. You know, it's shocking, but true. I, I, just, I just don't think we're that smart. I, um, I, I think, you know, we, we've made these technological advances and we still see them within the framework of where we are today. And I, I, I would venture to say 100 years ago, they thought they were sort of at the end of uh, end of the technological rope in, in some ways. And, and when, you, when you look at, uh, you know, I can look at as simple things like disease diagnosis. Like I, I lost my former wife to, to brain cancer, which was easily di identified. You know, you, you saw how the medicine treated, but we have really no idea how the brain actually worked enough to treat it. You know, ultimately we had to deal with things like the blood brain barrier and all those things. And so I, I sit there and I've gone to many conferences, a lot of futurists at them. And the general take on things like that is like cancer is going to be solved in 10 years. I'm like, we can't even get medication beyond the blood brain barrier. Like, like we are so far in some ways of our knowledge and we, uh, knowledge on anything in any area. 
And, you know, again, the, the moment we are in time looking back, and especially with the acceleration that we've seen since we've gotten into the computing age uh, with Moore's Law and, and the turnover in those cases, I, I think we, we have a sense that, that uh, we can reach the end within a, a given period of time, whether it's our lifetime or just beyond it. And I don't think we're really that close. I, I think it's actually going much, much further. And a lot of it is because of these intangibles and like how little things work. You realize again, like what a cancer cell, how to kill it, it's there, et cetera, et cetera. And you go at until you start going deeper and deeper. We thought the genome was everything. It's not. You know, and, and by the same token, when we start setting up these structures, our ability to account for these elements, no matter how big the brain is or how much data we pulled in and can parse it, it's still somewhat limited because there's all these secondary third level, fourth level, fifth level, things that actually feed why something happens. And you can look at that from problems ranging from disease diagnosis, dealing with COVID to, to poverty. And just the things that actually feed it are so different. And, and uh, people wrapping their brains around it and while living in it are, are so, is such a difficult thing to actually structure and account for that I, I I think things can get so much better. That's why we're all here on this panel. I do think there are limits. I, I just want to say that we've, you know, the, the concept of going to Mars or going to the moon and we're doing these amazing technological things, but all our emotions, we're still back in the caves. You know, we still, we have love, we have envy, we have anger, we have all these things. And so when somebody's trying to win over somebody in an argument, as you know, you can't approach it with logic. So we're coming back to how the, the kinds of emotions that, that people, when they react, they react from their gut, really. They really don't often react from the brain. And so I think that's what sort of stops the world community feeling more able to actually hear, listen to each other. How do we well, help yeah, them? We, that we one react from the brain. Yeah, we react from a part of the brain we're just not conscious of. We just react from the lizard brain. But... You know, that is still certainly something that a machine learning, you know, that an artificial neural network could recreate, right? The idea that like an AI has to always be logical or follow the same path or can only follow a, fill a set of non-creative problems, I think has already certainly been dis disproven. It sounds like Yali's already been working on that for a while. <laughs> so like, I, I think that we, we were talking about you know, you know, what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen? Are we all going to be one brain and whatever. I think that the, the scary thing, and this is, you know, Yali mentioned Neuralink of all the projects Elon Musk is working on, right. To get us off of fossil fuels and to get us back, you know, with a backup society on Mars, the most important one is actually Neuralink because with the Moore's law acceleration of AI, right. We are likely to be eclipsed. And so the opportunity of Neuralink says, okay, well, look, if you can actually integrate your brain with AI, right? Then we have an opportunity to go along for the ride, right? If we're completely stuck in our skulls and the AI is off doing whatever the AI wants to do, the fifth industrial revolution will be wonderful um, for all of us. But then the sixth, we won't be at the helm anymore. Well, my guys, we've got uh, five more minutes. I just want to say it whizzed past. And we don't have any questions per se, except an enthusiastic person, Alice, thank you. She loves the possibility of Amelia, as you can see. Write about the cynicism about Facebook from the younger generation. It says, but they still sway with what they need. I'm not quite sure what that comment meant exactly. But anyway, we have four minutes now. <laughs> so if anyone would like to say any concluding, their own concluding remarks from this, yeah, please do so. I'd like to say something about uh, Yali and Merrick, because it's, it's quite inspiring. Uh, because there's the empathy thing with AI, and uh, and Marek says we are not smart. So true. So um, the, the beauty of this, I think, even with Neuralink uh, that uh, Sam was talking about, I think that all these things are true, and all these things should continue moving forward. What we need is the counterbalance. Okay. So now, for example, Facebook has a position like a social network. We don't have a counterbalance to fight against it. So I think that Neuralink should continue, but we should have the opposite side of Neuralink uh, being built so that it creates a balance in the world. I think that that might, might save us, might save us for the sixth revolution because Sam, what he said is so true. 
we really need to pay attention. But we, yeah, as human beings, we need to see the problem first. Story showed us that we need to see the problem. We need to leave the problem before thinking about solving it. So, um, and, and, and I think that uh, we, repeating myself, we need those things. We need Neuralink. We need to go to Mars. We need, just for us to understand that, oh, oh, that's not the thing. Okay, let's try another thing. So that was my last bit for tonight. <laughs> so fo following on the same thing, I think that uh, we, we all discussed this. In a matter of decades, there will be robots around us. We would live a portion of our lives in virtual reality. We might read minds and we might back them up and become immortal. And the stakes of the technologies that we're currently wor talking about are going to become much more destructive if we can't start agreeing on the problems that we want them to solve. Right. Well, listen, thank you very much, everybody. It's been really great. And I think that we our discussion has been honestly most interesting, spirited. And it shows me, I think, for all of us that we have to join our future, our, our AI future with enthusiasm and deepest collaboration and imagination as well. So I would like to say to everybody here, we could actually got one more one more minute. Well, four minutes left. This is exciting. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We can have a whole other panel. Uh, yeah. I yeah. didn't do that. Oh, three minutes. Well, um, yeah. Actually, I was thinking of your Elon Musk question, and it, and it sort of, again, it kind of shows the biases, you know, again, his, you, you know, and there are even with somebody with his level of information and access to information and expertise in so many things has chosen to do something like look to Mars. Well, that, that's that's sort of a, a chest-thumping exercise, which then goes to human nature, as opposed to understanding what's under our sea, which we have no idea yet. We find new things under the sea every time a fisherman pulls up a net from a deep trench, and we don't look at that at all. Never mind what the energy resources are down there and things like that. I mean, we haven't really examined that. And again, it's the biases of looking up instead of looking within ourselves. And so much of this is how do we unleash that? How do we break down those pieces that I think will be key to having a successful future for all of us? And maybe touching on Emilio's point of, you know, we don't really try to solve the problem until we encounter it. And that's been human instincts forever. Um, but we have to find a way to subvert it. Like, just like we talked earlier about how the brain works, we kind of know that we find clever ways to subvert our own the functioning of our own brains for our own good. So we do have to also find a better way of at least visualizing or understanding problems because some problems take a long time to fix, right? As we're seeing with climate change and so on. So we need to get better at anticipating these problems, you know, internalizing them while there's still time to actually do something about it instead of always getting caught in this trap of short termism. Uh, that's sort of the readiness I was alluding to earlier as well. Uh, so that's something uh, we need to get better at as a civilization. As as the time scales and 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 the impacts become, you know, faster and 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 larger, we need to get better at anticipating and being ready. And uh, as Yali has repeated, we need to start to agree on a small set of common human values that we prioritize uh, in, in everything that we do, because uh, we're not you know, innocent bystanders and how AI or quantum or anything else plays out, we get to choose uh, what our priorities and objectives are. And we need to get better at communicating that and agreeing on some common human values more explicitly up front. And I think this, uh, the code, this pandemic has shown us, has brought us to a really strong realization of these issues that you've all raised here that we need it because there's not going to be just one COVID. There'll be another one, unfortunately, next, I don't know, soon enough. For sure. So the, our state of preparedness, I, I wonder if we've actually reached a point where we realize that, like from the California fires, is that they're not just one time a year for two weeks in, you know, August. They're almost all year round now. So we're in constant, constant reaction. And it's exhausting. And, and it makes you, it's like when you're in survival mode, you don't think straight, actually. So um, I think that the views that you've expressed today, actually collectively, I hope that uh, we can, uh, it would be wonderful to meet and have another conversation, actually, whether we're on Horasis or not. And I thank personally Horasis very much for this with 32 seconds left that we've been able to, to meet each other here today and to have this collective conversation. And I really hope that its recording can go out there in the world and help others 
make better decisions and be more collaborative around the world and uh, as well as in their our own backyard. So thank you again. Um, please, everybody, stay safe, travel safe internally and externally, <laughs> and all the very best to you. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Somebody else clicks this off, I think. Good to see you all. Bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Pleasure. Ding, ding, ding. Woof.